must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Feel, and I am joined today by a fellow with a very interesting story. It's one that we're kind of seeing more and more of these days. We're seeing a lot of students get into some of these medical programs, and whether it be PT, OT, speech, Cairo. DOs, MDs, and PhDs even, and they're not finishing out the program, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I have the esteemed pleasure to interview Geronimo Bejarano. Am I saying that right? Yes, correct. Okay. Geronimo, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how it's led us to to where you're at today. Yeah, so I went to UCF, um, University of Central Florida, I did four years there in exercise science, got my bachelor's degree. And I, because I was born in June, I'm like, uh, seven, I graduated high school at 17. And then I graduated college at 20, at 21. And because of how both DC and PT work, you kind of have to uh, apply the year prior for the following year. And I would have been 20. And I definitely didn't know what I wanted to do at that time. So I, I, I left uh, my UCF to, with, with, with a bachelor's degree. And I kind of just applied for any rehab science or exercise science um, jobs that were that were available. And at that time, I really had no idea about Cairo. Like I had never been to a Cairo or a PT. I knew that because I played sports, it's kind of what I wanted to do. And that's why I got my exercise science degree. And I'd shadowed PTs before, but I'd never shadowed a DC. But anyways, I, I got offered a, a rehab assistant job is what they called it. Um, for a, working for a DC. And that was my first kind of introduction to, to Kairos. And it was exactly what we kind of all hear about DC. Sometimes it was like the very pre post x-ray uh, you walk in long-term care plan. But at that time I had no idea, right? I had no idea that that was, there was even anything wrong with that. What I do, what I really got from those two years there was that I, since I had no mentorship, he was just like, whoever comes back here, you rehab them. It was a lot of reading for me. So I was introduced to a lot of the things that people may, might be introduced to that first year or two in school. So your McGill's, your McKenzie's, uh, all of those things. And also all of the people that kind of were t- like telling you to watch out for all of these different weekend seminars, like Greg Layman's or Ben Cormack's all of those things I got introduced to way before school even started. And that really became my journey in MSK and how much I fell in love with it. I was also told at the time, and now that I've had all these conversations, I'm not sure how true it is, but that the DC degree allowed you to open up a little easier because PTs maybe weren't point of access or didn't have that had to get referrals from MD. So it was a little harder to open up. And then I, now I understand that that is very state dependent. You probably know a lot more about that than I do. But that is the reason that I chose Cairo over PT was because I, even at that time, for those two years, I saw enough of the problems of, I don't want to treat like this. I don't want to be forced to treat like this as a new grad. And I definitely don't want to be forced to treat like this three year, three and a half years with $250,000 of student loan debt. And I don't even like my job. So I was on the whole train of I'm going to open up 
right after school. I don't, I'm just going to jump through these hoops during school because I, I was, by that time, I was aware of the I, I, quackier side of Cairo, but I was also told that as long as you jump through the hoops, you could open up and treat how you wanted and make the money that you wanted to make. And that's how I ended up at Cairo. Yeah. So there's definitely a lot of overlap between PT and Cairo. Um, you know, Cairo's, uh, you know, perform a lot of adjustments. PTs like to call manipulations. At the end of the day, it's high velocity, low amplitude right. thrusts. Same basic stuff. We're just calling it kind of different things. Um, you know, Cairo is based a lot more on those adjustments and manipulations, whereas PT has a little bit more exercise related to it. But I, I've worked with great Cairos and I've worked with terrible Cairos. I've worked with great PTs. I've worked with terrible PTs. So, I mean, you know, it, it's a matter of just knowing who is uh, ethical, who is, um, you know, out to get the patient better. Th there's this ongoing quote unquote battle where PTs and Kairos butt heads, you know, but at the end of the day, there can be a lot of synergy, right? There can be a lot of, of working together and overlap. And that's, that's fine. I think if, if it's, if it's done right and if it's done, you know, well, let's take a look at the bigger picture though here. You know, you mentioned a lot of things that, that rubbed you the wrong way, you know, what was really the, the first couple of red flags that went up that got you thinking that, you know, Hey, uh, I, I'm in, chiropractor school and yet I don't know if I want to continue that road like what were the first couple of things that said ah man I don't know if this is for me after all yeah I mean I was pretty prepared by the time chiro school for some of the stuff that was going to happen hey it still got very very quaggy very fast I mean we had a lot of philosophy classes the first three semesters and by philosophy it's not the philosophy that maybe the people that are listening to this are accustomed to it's very you know the the traditional Cairo philosophy of bones go out of place you put them back in and there's a, a higher power what they call it innate intelligence kind of flows through you and you know you don't need anything else you don't need medicine you don't need anything at all that is that is it as long as you have that you know the body that heals itself is basically what they say which is funny because they don't even acknowledge natural history but but that is that was really i didn't think it was going to get that bad but it, it for sure was was really troubling but i think the the part for me that really kind of opened up my eyes was i was reading a lot of research by by that time and that first semester and and beyond we had a lot of palpation classes and they were very on the trend of you can palpate anything. Like basically the, one of the, the, the running jokes is that the way that you get better at palpation is you get a piece of hair and then you, you put it under a, a book or a piece of paper and you feel it. And then once you can feel that you put another piece of paper or whatever, and then that's how you get better at your palpation skills. So you, you can pal palpate these for them, subluxations, other people call them joint restrictions, whatever, same thing. And I was really, it was really hard for me to grasp that because I was reading all of the palpation literature that basically said we cannot do that or we just don't have the power. And also it probably doesn't matter. Like pain is so much more complicated than that, even if we could do that. And I, that was maybe my first or second semester in school. Actually, I, I shared a picture of, of a screenshot of an email that I'd sent Greg Lehman about this April 4th. So that meant that I had been in school maybe a month. And I was like, I'm being taught this and I'm not understanding that. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's uh, either Cairo and PT school, right? Because PTs are also taught a lot of this palpation stuff. You just kind of have to get through it. Don't even think about it. He's like, I haven't even thought about it in 15 years. You should stop thinking about it to stop wasting your time even reading the literature around it because you, you've got it. That's when I was like, okay, so is everything am I going to be taught something that I have to uh, think about read about like I have to check my my teachers on everything it's not just these philosophy classes and that's when it really started to get very frustrating for me yeah we had Greg on the show uh, a couple years ago and brilliant guy uh, love talking with him um, but but I, I think he had a good kind of outlook on things right the fact that like yeah some of it's going to be a little bit odd you're going to be taught a bunch of different things but at the end of the day you know you got to just kind of take it in and then learn 
the way that you want to learn and practice the way that you want to practice based off that, you know, so I get that, but we're coming to terms now with a lot of outdated research and a lot of things that just simply aren't true that are still being taught in PT school, in Cairo school, probably even in med school as well, if we go that far. My biggest issue is the debt to income ratio that's occurring these days. And, you know, I wrote a book, PT Educator Student Debt Eliminator, to help PTs and, and, you know, clinicians and academicians help pay down their student loans quicker using the skills they were taught in, in, you know, whatever their respective schooling was to, to open up more revenue streams for themselves. Because, you know, as PT, the, the median average of, you know, debt once they graduate is over 150,000 right now. I've had people, you know, come through my course that are 200, 250,000 in debt right out of graduation. And, and they're possibly going to be making 65, 75,000 a year as a new grad. So, I mean, it's not a bad job, but at the same time, if you've got $250,000 worth of student loan debt, it's not a great job. You know, the, that, that debt to income ratio just isn't there. So talk us through a little bit about some of the financial ramifications that you started thinking about with all of this. Right. So for me, I've heard a lot of people say that you kind of just have to jump through the hoops and you'll get be able to to practice how you want at the end. For me, just how you mentioned, when you talk about what that tuition is, I don't I think that we are excusing the schools by saying that if you were going to charge that much money. So for Cairo school, because there is no state school, every single Cairo school in America is at least one hundred and twenty thousand dollar tuition. Right. There is no, you know, I know UT Austin is like $35,000 for the whole entire program, which is that really makes creepy worth it. Right. Um, and so there is not, that's not an option. So it's $120,000 tuition, give or take a couple thousand, depending on what state you're in. And it's lower. The new grad pay is lower than PT new grad pay. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some things that say that your five and 10 year pay are going to be higher because most people open up. But most small businesses fail, right? And if you're forcing, so we, Cairo schools, another problem with Cairo schools is they accept a lot more than, than PT schools. So you are graduating, I don't know, 300 Cairos in a year from a school and everybody can't open up, right? It's not fair that the only way for you to get a sustainable job is for you to open up eventually. And if you're forcing every single Cairo that graduates to open up and or starve, essentially, you are going to get a lot of care that is low value, a lot of people that are doing it just to try to pay off loans. And to me, that is not healthcare. If you're, if you're trying to do things for money instead of for the patients, that's starting to become real unethical at some point. And, but I get it. I also understand it because I was there. I was in the middle of it and I was lucky enough to be introduced to some people and well read enough to say, this is a problem. I need to figure out how I can, I, I'm not going to give up my, 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 I don't know, my, my values, but what am I going to do about this? Because I also don't want to don't want to starve. Like I went to school so I could make more money than the average person. And so what are we going to do about this? And that was one of the things that in school, I really felt like that failed us in the sense that, yeah, sure, they taught us good basic science. But after that, they did not warn us about what was the true debt to income ratio that was going to happen which I think is something that medical school does really well. Obviously they have way higher pay once you get out of residency, but you know, like you know going into medical school what your, what your debt is gonna be, what your income is gonna be if you make it all the way through to, to your past your residency to fellowship or to be an attending. And also they are very intellectual. There's a lot of intellectual humility going on in medical school. Every single one of my uh, friends that did MD are told day one, 50% of the things that you're going to learn in this next four years are going to be outdated by the time you get to residency and the other 50% are going to eventually be outdated. That to me is intellectual humility. And that is a little bit of what I wish for more DC and PT schools. 
just let me know that there is a gray area. What is the uh, opposing side to this, especially in the field that we kind of work in where it's a lot of gray, right? And it's not that simple pathology or not simple, but like sinister pathology where X comes in and you give them Y and we have 20 years of RCT showing that this is what we should do. We don't have that for, for MSK pain. And it, I think a lot of the problems that we have in our PT and DC schools are that depending on what school you go to, they'll tell you an answer. And that to me, with the income, with the income debt ratio, it's a problem. And I, I saw APTA, right, put up a post about a week ago or so talking about the, the, the Bureau of Statistics put out that it's just even at 120,000, I think it was, it's just unsustainable for new grad PT pay. The new grad uh, Cairo pay is not only lower, but our, our debt ratio is around 250,000. So it's higher. It's about almost $100,000 higher than, than the average PT debt. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, you bring up a lot of really good points there I want to touch on. The first one, that gray area, uh, it's kind of like a running joke in PT school and throughout the PT community that uh, the answer is generally, it depends, right? That's a phrase that we use all the time. Well, it depends. Well, what, you know, the, the, the next step is, okay, fine, but why does it depend then? You know, right. like we have to take that next step to go down that road and figure out, okay, you know, why does it depend. And, and I think, you know, I'm just starting in academia and I'm just starting to teach now. And again, it, it took me a while to get to this point, to be comfortable enough to go into a job teaching in a system that I felt was flawed and broken. Um, but my own situation and, you know, graduating with two doctoral degrees and $140,000 worth of student loan debt, uh, really, you know, opened my eyes to, like you said, that debt to income ratio issue and more the fact that I could leverage the degrees and I could leverage the letters after my name into other things right. where I felt that PT should just be the tip of my iceberg. And I mean, I've done things as crazy as, you know, I came up with a course for fantasy football injuries. I came up with a course and an ebook for uh, video gamers and esports injuries. Um, you know, things that interested me, things that I could get behind, passion, you know, projects that I right. love doing. And it didn't matter if I really made any money off them, which I ended up doing. But, you know, it was just a matter of like, wow, like I could do so much with this and so much with these, you know, degrees that are not really related to the degree that, you know, it, it, it made me feel like, yeah, I mean, I was even, you know, doing things as far as like digital marketing, you know, and I was learning other skills that I could tie into the healthcare field. Uh, and that really put me at ease and let me know that as long as I could leverage it and show my future students how they could leverage it and think outside the box, they didn't have to be in that, you know, world of Shirley Sarmet or, or Stanley Paris or McKenzie or any of those, right? right. They're all just kind of thoughts and theories and, and, and ways and methods of, of teaching treatments and stuff. And they all have, you know, some validity to them and they all don't because like you said, MSK is, is a wild wild and crazy world to live in so you know if we're looking at weird musculoskeletal stuff it's not always straight and narrow and uh you know again i think the the financial ramifications of what we were dealing with there was was really you know what got me worried at first I and mean, if i didn't find a way to leverage it and and i was an english major to begin with so that was a really weird shift for me anyway to go into science and and you know look at cadavers and and all that so it was a weird place for me to be in, but I think because I have that creative outlet that I have this desire to like go different directions and, and get outside the box and, and step outside of that nine to five clock in clock out kind of thing. So, you know, it's worked out for me. I just hope it can work out for other people too, you know, in the future. And that's, that's kind of my driving force behind teaching is that, you know, at least I can open their eyes to there are other possibilities out there. And speaking of other possibilities, tell us a little bit now about your journey and your direction and what you plan to do moving forward. Right. So I, I felt the same way that, that you did. I wanted a degree that essentially allowed me to do more. So the DC degree really doesn't have that weight especially outside of chiropractic, right? So about a year, a year and a half ago, 
I got even farther into reading research. So before I only read it from a clinical standpoint, at, at one point I started to say, I have a lot more questions and answers. And I think a lot of people do, but I found a lot more of the passion and the nuance that maybe clinicians don't have to go that far, right? If you're gonna, like, that's how I tell my friends that definitely want to go into clinical care. Like you don't need to read some of the stuff that I read because it's honestly, that is research level stuff to where you only need to read that if you're about to try to propose a project or try to understand some stuff. And I got really interested in a lot of that and a lot of social determinants of health. I started to, to see, so the, the way that I got into that was that I got really into what's the minimum intervention that we can do for low back pain or any pain really. And it started to be like walking, like walking is just as good as almost anything that we have right now. And so why aren't people walking more? And then that's when I started seeing like the social determinants of health and all of the other things. And I was like, wow, this is goes so much farther than clinical care, just population level health, that community level stuff, eventually policy and just built environment and all of these things that kind of affect a person on a day to day and really limit the choices that, that people can really make. And it's so much bigger than just regular, I choose to walk more or not. And while I started reading some of that stuff, the pandemic kind of started. So this was last March and I had a couple of friends that reached out and wanted to be on a project together that ended up getting published. I loved that whole getting onto a Zoom meeting and trying to go through consensus on a paper and what we wanted to write. I really enjoyed that. that and then everybody kind of, especially because we were all students publishing it, a lot of people were really reached out, especially the DC PhDs reached out like, this is awesome that you guys are doing this and got published as all student co-authors. And I got connected with a lot of people that I probably wouldn't have been connected with if I hadn't gotten that paper published. And that allowed me to be part of a couple of projects, even lead a systematic review that we're in extraction right now for and get on the phone calls with a lot of people all over the world. So I, I work a lot with Josh Sadro and his team over at University of Sydney. And he connected me with Mary O'Keefe and we're doing a project as well. So that has really like just my passion for that was above and beyond. And at one point I said, I know what I want to do. I want to go get a PhD immediately after I'm done with my DC. Why was I going to do that? Because I thought my clinical degree was always a good backup plan. But I knew with a PhD and with the NIH's loan repayment program that I could do what I wanted. I could also get those loans kind of down. They have a really good program that's like a 50% acceptance rate right now. And it ends up being like they pay off like a hundred and something of your thousand of your student loans in three years. They just give you, a, there's a direct check from NIH to the loan provider. And it's, it's, so I thought, I was like, you know what? I have like about five years to leverage this and then I can apply for that program. And also I'll have my PhD and I can really do research and maybe even policy work. And so I'm going to set myself up for this. So I started contacting all of the different schools that I thought uh, I would really enjoy. So Duke, UNC, is the two schools that I probably talked most with, I had a, a, a lot of really good connections with Chad Cook. And he's him and Mike Ryman have helped me so much throughout all of this process. And Chad has brought me on a couple of projects. And I really thought that Duke or UNC was going to be it for me. My girlfriend actually got offered a job about a month ago in Austin, Texas that we just couldn't pass up. And it's funny to think about because her salary is higher than the new grad PT or DC salary and she's got an associate's degree, right? So that, that and no student loan debt, obviously. And that to me was, was kind of the breaking point. It was never anything at school that was like, oh, this really broke me. Like I was, I was pretty done with school by that time. Like I was like, you know what, like this is, it is what it is. And I wasn't even really speaking up in class or, or anything like that. But when she got offered that, I reached out to the people that I've been talking to at UT Austin and I told them my situation and they were like, honestly, we can get you in-state tuition here. And I mean, you are in, in Texas, so you know what in-state tuition is for University of Texas. It's nothing. Yeah, it's amazing. The, uh, the in-state tuition here for their programs and, and I had I to do it all over again, I'm from New York originally, I would have just stayed in, I would have gone gra uh, uh, community college for two years, then in-state school for two years, finish off the bachelor's, then probably in-state as well for grad school. But I just wasn't thinking at the time. I didn't know. I, I got we sold didn't the know. 
Yeah, um, that, that's, that's gotta, another Got to go to the best school, got to get the best degree, you know, whatever. Uh, right. And so that's kind of how it happened with me was I, I opened up the, their tuition planner and I was like, you mean, so because I wasn't going to get a DC, I had to do a master's before a PhD. Their master's PhD, not all schools are like that. Some schools you can go bachelor's PhD, but their master's PhD, which is, which was fine with me because it was a year, it's a year and a half. And that's exactly how much time I had left, essentially. It's adding about six months to my PhD time or start date, but it is almost $40,000 less just if I would have finished that last year. So my last year of DC school would have cost me about $46,000 in tuition alone. And a whole entire master's at UT Austin is going to cost about $12,000. And to me, coupled with the fact that if my girlfriend was going to go to Austin, which of course she was, because it was a, a great, it's a great job offer. We would have to now be paying two rents instead of one. So you add in the fact that I also wasn't working. So now that's a higher, more student loans that I had to take out, right? So I could pay my rent and stuff like that, plus fly out there. It's like, this is going to be a $70,000 decision. And it, to me, it was a no-brainer. I Don't get me wrong. A lot of people that are in academia will tell you academia is also not easy. It's also not exactly the highest paying job either. A PhD, obviously... It's funny because some people complain about the PhD stipend, which is around 30,000, uh, give or take, depending on where you are. But to me, it was like, they're going to pay me 30,000 instead of me paying 46,000 for, for a DC degree every year. And then some like, it's, you know, we're talking a huge difference. And I still think that PhD should be a, a higher stipend, of course. But when you come from that DC PT, you're just kind of lucky to, or you're happy to be there. Um, yeah, you, you're hitting on a lot of lot of high points here that I want to go back and touch on. So first off, I had the very same reaction you did only for my EDD, right? I figured it would be a good fallback plan in case my clinical work didn't, you know, pan out. And now as it turned out, things flip flop and now I'm, I'm right. doing that full time, right? But uh, so physical therapy has the physical therapy assistant as well, right? That's a mm -hmm. two year uh, associate's degree as well. And, you know, it's kind of a, a, a two-way street because, you know, PTAs are worried that, you know, they're going to be out phased and they're not going to be used much anymore, but, you know, there's a lot of clinics still using them and there's a lot of facilities still using them and you get paid a good portion of a PT salary, not quite as much, obviously, but, you know, pretty good amount to have way less debt, only two years of school and way less responsibility too. your documentation. All you're doing is treatments every day. So your documentation is, is pretty, you know, simple. So like when people, especially PTAs ask, well, should I become a PT? Should I do my, my transitional program into a PT? And it's like, I don't know. I can't really recommend that from a return on investment standpoint. It's hard to say. I mean, it's different for everybody, right? Everybody's got their own situations, but like, you know, if you're making a pretty good salary right now and you have not that much student loan debt, you'd almost be better off doing something else, like, you know, being a PTA and then, you know, starting a side business as a personal trainer or a, right. you know, a consultant or something different than, than getting your doctorate, you know, but then let's take it a, a step further and now look at academia and same thing. Like you said, yeah, the pay is not always great, but there are a lot of interesting opportunities there and it depends, right? State school versus private school where I teach right. university in Augustine, it's a private school. So the salary is way, you know, way more than, than if it were to be a, a state school. So it's, it's really actually a great position for me. Like I, I, I have, you know, very few qualms about teaching there. The, the, the bigger issue is, okay, what am I going to do with this? You know, now right. that I'm in academia, how do I push the, the, you know, the needle forward? How do I, how do I get things moving in a direction where I feel like we're making an impact or that we're changing the world? You know, how are we making things better? Because again, the whole point of this podcast is that academia is kind of a broken system, especially in healthcare. How do we fix that? Right. And I've only been teaching now for a little less than a year. So I don't know, I don't know the answers. Right. But we've had all these experts on to talk about how they think it's broken and how they would fix it. And that's been a good starting point, at least, you know, one of the things I want to talk about with you is, you know, you've gone through a partial DC program, right? Um, 
how now are you feeling as far as like just being at peace and comfortable with your decision to withdraw from a program and go the direction that you're going? Cause it sounds like you're set up to do some really great things now uh, on this trajectory. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of things that can be involved with leaving a program, right? You can feel that, that guilt, that shame, that like, you know, uh, friends and family and classmates are going to talk about it and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, at the end of the day, how do you feel as far as your, your comfort level with, with the decision you've made? I, I really feel, I, I felt all of those things that you, you, you mentioned, but I felt really comfortable with my decision because of the mentors that I kind of had surrounding the, the decision. And I had a lot of conversations before the decision was made and a lot of people, even some of the, the big time PT PhDs or DC PhDs have all acknowledged that the system is kind of broken and we're not really allowing uh, people to, to have a real look at what is going to happen once they graduate. And we are putting a lot of barriers to people be able to practice at the top of their license. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the amount of people that were just graduating. We're just graduating too many people for the amount of jobs that there are. And it's going to become even less as technology kind of starts getting higher and higher. Like Josh Sadro's P, uh, postdoc right now is on creating an app uh, that could uh, really help or hopefully will help because he's going to do an RCT on it. Uh, uh, people that are getting total knee and total hip replacements after so they can do all of their rehab through the app. Why is that important in Australia? Because they have a waiting list, right? And so it's a waiting list to see a PT. Uh, the problem is that maybe PTs might be wasting their time seeing maybe too many of that total knee, total hip replacement people that, that kind of could do an app and, and get better. And there are people that could actually really, really need PT, one-on-one -on -one PT care. And they're having to wait, like your really chronic low back pain that has, you know, quote unquote, waited for that natural history done a lot of things like they really need to see somebody they're waiting 12 months to get into a pt in australia just the way their healthcare system is set up so they're trying to find different ways to kind of lower that uh waiting list for the people that actually need to see pts what if that starts happening in, in america right the insurance companies start catching on that some of these websites or some of these walking groups that are kind of taking over in some of these other places that they're just as good as one-on-one -on -one care. And now we're creating, now there's less jobs, right? And PT schools need to acknowledge, and in, the APTA acknowledges this, right? They they said that on their uh, on their blog post uh, a week ago when they talked about the, the debt to income ratio. Like before you start another PT school, you really need to think about what you're doing to the profession. And the same thing is really happening to DC schools. And so my my big thing was, I didn't wanna be somewhere where my values were going to, to start maybe having to take a turn for pay. And so with my, with the PhD, I felt really comfortable with it because of the mentors that kind of allowed to talk me, like they talked me through it and they told me the different opportunities. And just like how you said, the PhD for me uh, allows me to do things outside of research and academia too. It allows me to leverage the degree to say, hey, I'm really, I'm really good at managing people. I'm really good at managing my time. Look, I did a whole entire PhD program if academia doesn't work out for me or research doesn't work out for me or whatever, the PhD degree allows me to walk into almost any job. I'm going to be pretty good at statistics. I'll be pretty good at coding uh, any job. And that's something that uh, Zach Rathorn really told me was he was about to finish his PhD. And he's like, if I don't get into the VA postdoc, which he, he was going to, he's at over at Duke. He's like, I'm in the research triangle. Do you know how many technology companies are here that I could go and leverage his PhD to, to get a job? And that to me, when he told me that, that really sunk in. It's like, this degree is not just research, not just academia. I can do so much with this degree that I couldn't do with my DC degree. Uh, that it just didn't hold the same amount of weight outside of healthcare. And that allows me to feel a little, a lot more comfortable with my decision. Plus, I don't have to think about student loans anymore, at least taking them out wise. And it was just such an easy decision at that time. And it still is to me. And the more that uh, that kind of Twitter thread that I did went viral and people started reaching out from all over, just kids that are lost, lost in the system. They made the decision when they were 22, 23 years old, and now they're a hundred and something thousand dollars in student loan debt. 
and there's no turning back. They really want to do clinical care, but they also acknowledge the problems. And I got, I think the one that really resonated with me most is the way that we do clinical clinicals and DC degrees all at the end. And you're at first, you're in a student clinic on campus, and then you go out and do your, what they call a preceptorship for about six months at any outpatient DC. And we were in that student clinic that the, the DC school has, like it's their student clinic and you're under the clinicians there. They almost force you to, to pass down patients. People come in forever, five, six years, once a week. And because it's student clinic, it's either really, really cheap or free if you're a government employee. And so like people don't care, right? But at the same time, you're not helping the, the people and you're also not helping uh, students kind of get that real life experience. You're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to see anything that you're actually going to see in real life from somebody that comes in once a week for five years. They have nothing wrong with them. Yeah. They're just coming in with their for their daily adjustment. And one of the kids was like, one of the kids told me, hey, I really resonate with everything you've said. I've heard you speak in class, all of these things. The worst part about it is I want to be able to help somebody get into self-management, but I haven't been taught how and I haven't done the reading outside of school. And to me, if you're paying $120,000 and your, your students don't even know how to get somebody to self-management, you've failed them. Again, a lot of great points there. I, I want to bring up a text that I got the other day. Funny that you mentioned the app. It says, hi, Scott, have you heard of Recovery One for Cigna? This is a virtual physical therapy now in your benefits, and it could make each day a little bit better. Press S to sign up for this covered benefit now or M to, uh, for more information, reply X to opt out. So I don't know anything about it. I haven't done the research on it yet, but I just got a text out of nowhere uh, just saying, hey, we got this new virtual physical therapy program and that's coming from Cigna. So the, right. the insurance companies are there. They're starting to catch on. They're already putting out their own version of physical therapy through telehealth and telemedicine, which is fine. We've seen that it works a right. lot of times. Um, however, you know, <laughs> the insurance companies have been fighting physical therapy for all this time. And now all of a sudden right. they're on board with it because it's going to make them more money, you know? So it's just right. a funny circle that we've kind of come into. But again, I want to touch on mentorship a little bit because that's what saved me as well. I got two years into my four year EDD and I started worrying again, like, why am I doing this? Why am I throwing more money at this? This is not the direction I need to be heading. What the heck am I going to do with an EDD if I don't want to teach? And again, I had the right mentors. Most of them were business minded. You know, I, I, I talked to people in the PT world that were, you know, already opened their own business or had their own online business or whatever. I talked to Greg Todd. I talked to Jerry Durham. I talked to Paul Goff. And, uh, you know, these are guys that I've followed for years and I just really, truly admire for what they do in the business world. And every one of them had the same thing to say. As long as you leverage your degree and your letters after your name, you'll be fine. You know, you can do whatever you want with them you know, just take the knowledge that you gain, take the experiences right. that you had and turn them into something productive that'll solve a problem for somebody in the, you know, in the world. And as long as you're the best solution to a problem, people are going to pay you for it. So, you know, I've had consulting job. I have a business where I, you know, kind of did a little bit of injury prevention and wellness education for, for local businesses for, you know, try to lower their workman's comp costs, social determinants of health, right? We talked a little bit about that. I've, I've worked with, you know, trying to work further upstream and treat before things happen, you know, with uh, a lot of guidance from like Mike Eisenhart and Don Magnuson and, and Todd Davenport. And, and, you know, there's just so many good people out there doing so much bigger things than clocking in and clocking out and treating right. 20 patients a day or whatever it may be that, you know, as long as you take that, that moment and that pause and listen to what your mentors have to say, you know, they'll lead you in a pretty good direction. And so, you know, I'm happy to hear that, that, that that's the way you're heading because it, it sounds like, again, you just have so many good opportunities and it's like to hell with the naysayers, you know, because, <laughs> it only matters what's going to work for you and your family and, and how you're going to help, you know, have an impact. And if you didn't feel like you could have an impact, you know, in one direction and you turned and went another direction, even if it's, you know, doesn't look right to other people and it doesn't right. seem to make sense to them, it doesn't matter when you know your big picture. It's, you know, it's, it's hard to see the label when you're inside the bottle. Right. So yeah. I, I think you're on the right path. And, and, and I'd love for you, if you don't mind, to just give a little bit of advice to, to those that are maybe thinking about dropping out of a program or, you know, thinking that maybe they're in a the wrong spot or they, they're stuck and they don't know what to do. What kind of advice would you give to those folks? 
I would say it's the same advice that I give to people that are treating is give that informed consent. And in order for you to give that informed consent, you have to be informed, right? You have to know what you're, what you're talking about research wise. And the same thing goes to if you're going to make this decision or you're, you're a little scared about you've listened to this podcast or saw something and talked to somebody that kind of made you doubt, make sure that you do all of the research behind what are the potential next steps? What are the things that really would drive you, but also will make it sense income to debt ratio? And once you find that thing that you're saying, hey, I would love to wake up and do this. And also it might actually pay what I deserve to be paid. Go for it. Kind of take that jump and make sure that you talk to the people that are have done it. Because if you are, especially if you're in a DC or PT program, there are people that have done so many different things with those degrees and not just go to a PhD or an EDD or a PsyD, but MBAs and just completely left healthcare in general. And it's just like, I had no idea until I started asking around and saw people that just went into, went into politics, went into policy work. And it's just, I was just like, wow, there's so much you can do that it might be your bigger passion. Right. And it, it it doesn't mean that you're kind of giving up on clinical care or anything like that. You're just finding different ways to get to a destination than other people might have. And that's okay too. So for me, the way uh, to a PhD, a lot of people would have gone master's PhD, right? Which is eventually what I'm going to do now. But had I finished a DC, there was a lot that I could bring to a PhD table that master students couldn't because of my clinical experience. Right. So there, you might think that it's a hindrance for you to have a clinical experience if you're going completely outside of the, the usual clinical path. But actually, there's a lot that you can bring to a table because of your experiences as a clinician or as a student clinician that other people in those areas cannot. And you have a different experiences. And that's something that you should leverage as well. Yeah, sure, you'll have your, your weaknesses, but also a lot of the strengths that you'll have is a lot of the things that people that go that the typical route for whatever destination you're going to won't have. And I think you should really, really try to leverage that. Yeah. I think if there's one takeaway word from this entire episode, it's leverage. You know, I think that's, that's the key. That's the take home at the end of the day is, is whatever you decide to do, as long as you can leverage it, I think right. it's the right choice for you, you know? Well, Geronimo, I want to thank you so much for taking your time to come on and talk with us today about this, this you know, ever-increasing program and, and uh, systematic issue that we have with healthcare education. But we ask every uh, guest at the end of each episode, if you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be, you know, DPT or DC, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? Uh, I think I have... One that is unreasonable, which is tuition costs, which, you know, it's just so unreasonable. But the, it's the actually one think, the number one given answer is cost. So you're yes. right on with that one. Uh, but and you say the, unreasonable, but realistically, I mean, look at inflation over the last 20 years. It's gone up two, two, three percent every year. Education's gone up eight to 14 percent every year. So uh, how is that unreasonable? Like we just need to pull it back in a little and be like, no, 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 this isn't going to work. There has to be some sort of legislature that that puts a cap on that or something because it's getting out of hand. Right. I, I think the way that I was kind of phrasing reasonable is something that could change on Monday. And that to me is, or well, today's Monday, but that could change right now is that to me is that informed consent that I'm talking about, like that intellectual humility, that teachers kind of walking in first semester for these students and being like, this is what the actual outlook is hey, you're going to be this much in debt. This is what the normal, like sitting down with these first semester students or, or hopefully even before and being I was going to say that may go further back, even high school. You know, we right. need to let them know, even if, if you're going to go to college, totally cool. Think it's, you know, not for everybody, right. but most people want to go to college. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's state versus private. You know, here's what happens when you take out the loans, right? If you don't have right. the money to pay for it. You know, here's how that's going to affect you later on in life. Okay. Buying a house, buying a car, like those things exactly. are going to come into play. And I didn't, I never had that education, you know, and nope. I, I just feel like, you know, my, my economics class was, you know, basically supply and demand and that was it, right? Like that's your business savvy. That's not good enough, right? We need to teach 
general basic, you know, economics to students as far as like real world, you know, cashing a check, what a credit card means, you know, like all these things that you're, they're going to need in the real world. We need more of that earlier on, I think, in, in our curriculum. Yeah, I think schools right now kind of throw it to the side because they they have a mandatory like little video mod that you have to do when you take out student loans. And let's be honest here, nobody's watching those three minute videos from studentloans.gov. They're just waiting for the time clicker to go down and you're just clicking it through. You need you need to kind of inform people with that about what the decision you're making. And, and that's not to, I think either of us are saying, don't go the PT or don't go the DC route. Well, I'll tell you if you can go it's stay school PT, definitely go stay school PT route. Um, but what it is, is it's, you're informing people, right? Like people are still going to want to be PTs and DCs. Like clinical care is still something that really drives a lot of people. And it should, because it, it's really valuable work and it is needed for a lot of things, but you need to make sure that people are informed about the decision that they're making, because if not, it's almost predatory that people come out and they have no idea, especially at the age that a lot of people are coming in, 22 years old, like you just don't know. You're like, oh, cool. I got into a doctor program of being able to treat people or, or especially athletes at the beginning, right? Everybody wants to treat athletes. Like I might be able to treat an athlete one day and all these things. And it's like, it's unfair what we're doing to students and putting it in a position where we're just creating this, you're adding to this problem of bad healthcare and low value care. And it's, I understand why, like, it's a lot of debt. There's a lot of debt and I get it. And so I think that's something that everybody could do on, on tomorrow is make sure that your students understand what they're getting themselves into. And I don't think, and it's, if some people kind of leave, that might be a good thing. And the people that stay are really going to be determined to figure out ways to make it work and have at least those three years in school to kind of set themselves up for when they come out to make it work. Yeah. Great advice. Well, Geronimo, thank you so much for your time and for coming on and, and kind of telling your story for our audience. I think that'll be very helpful for any of those that may be unsure or unclear or sitting on the fence. Where can people reach out to you if they want to follow up with you or just see what you're up to these days, whether it be email or social media, uh, we'll throw it in the show notes. Yeah, Twitter is the best bet. That's what I honestly, if you're a PT or DC student, go on there. It is amazing what you could find on there. Like you find the, the big time researchers, big time clinicians, just kind of talking things through on there. I really recommend going on there. It was, the, it was a blessing for me. And so I'm Jero5, G-E-R-O-5 on there. And if at any point any student wants to reach out and kind of talk things through, I'm always available. I had that I had that for my, from my mentors and from the people that I kind of reached out to. And I would love to be able to help some students out for whatever they need because I've been there. And a lot of people have been there. And I think that's something that that you guys should all remember is that a lot of people have gone through exactly what you what you're going through and they can really help or at least be a someone to listen to yeah well thank you so much for your time again and uh yeah we're going to be neighbors soon so we'll have to uh, yeah. grab a drink get together and Definitely. grab a drink sometime man i look forward to it me too all right but have a good one and best of luck in the future you too thank you Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. And the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.